feel hopeless. Maybe you feel like you can't see two feet in front of you. It's our soul that we encourage because naturally our soul wants to be discouraged. Our soul wants to be afraid. Our soul wants to feel hopeless and we encourage ourselves. We encourage our soul by reminding it who God is. He is the way maker. He is the promise keeper. He is always working. And so let's do that as we go into this bridge. Let's sing Even When. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
times when we go through life and just things that come with life, we, uh, we wait until the breakthrough happens or the way it comes to praise. And we get, you know, so caught up with everything going on that we forget to praise until that breakthrough happens. He is the way maker. He will make a way, but you got to praise him before he makes the way. A lot of times that means using your words to speak things into existence. Um, you have to prophesy the promise of your life sometimes. Um, and so, you know, us coming out of Waymaker and telling God who he is and praising him for who he is, not what he's done. We're going to the next, this next song. And um, that's exactly what it is. It's prophesying a promise for your life and your, your next generation, your kids, you know, it's prophesying the promise that God has on your life. Um, and so with the heart of praising God for who he is, not what he's done or what he's going to do, we have to be in this moment to prophesy the breakthrough that's coming. Great. 
Come on. Say it with me. He is for me. Come on, say it again. He is for me. Come on, you got to let that sink in. He is for me. Come on, it'll break loose here in just a minute. He is for me. If he is for me, then who can be against me? Lord, we come to you. We thank you. God, you are for us. Lord, let your face shine upon our face. In the midst of all that's going on, God, you're for us. You're for us. When everybody's trying to say and come against us, you're for us. And we give you the praise and the glory, and we say to that, Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand in this place. Woo! your Bibles turn to Matthew chapter 5 and um, verse 9 it's the uh, it's the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes Jesus is talking we're going to catch up in the middle of the sermon he says blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Now, I find it very interesting that those are all next to each other. That says, blessed are the peacemakers... And then he goes on to talk about people casting insults at you and persecuting you. And last week we talked about true peace and that it comes from being in Christ Jesus. See, the issue with being in Christ Jesus is that it ain't popular. (laughs) It's, It's not the popular thing right now. And... He's not talking about, when he says blessed are the peacemakers, he's not talking about you walking around trying to get everybody to get along. That's not what he's talking about. And we're going to look at some things here. Look at Matthew 10, verse 20. And you will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes again. See, we're living in a day that the pressure is on the true believers like never before. There's pressure. And our goal here at DCC is to fulfill the call 
to make disciples and mature the saints. And that's not a popular message at all. In today's world of choice and preference and tolerance, that is just not very popular. And in Ephesians, look in Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature of which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Now, let me tell you the scheme. When our identity is in Christ, let me tell you, we're not going to be, if our, if our identity is not in Christ, we are not going to be able to stand the pressure. And when you don't have the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher at work in the body of Christ, you can't be equipped for the work of service and being built up Come on. And so it is a scheme of the enemy to pull and draw back all of those that are to mature us. See, we don't talk about the apostle. We don't really like talking about the prophet. We can tolerate the evangelist as long as he's not in the house and he's just running all over the country. Come on. And not putting a demand on us. And we, we really love the pastor guy because he's married to the church and he's the one that just tolerates everything. And we kind of like the teacher guy because, you know, we all like history. But the enemy has successfully worked out the prophet that says, boys, here's where God's taken the church. The apostle that says, hey, we need some discipline here. The evangelist that puts a demand on us and shows us how to reach our communities. Because, see, we like Christianity where we just come into church, sit down, and let the pastor do everything. We love that kind of Christianity. See, our identity has to be in Christ, and we can't do that if we're not equipped and maturing in the Lord to the fullness. So it is vital to understand that dying to self, taking up the cross, putting your hand to the plow is very important because at some point, a decision will have to be made on who we fear to maintain our peace, and that's very important. See, we're going to have to, uh, who are we going to fear? Look in Numbers 13, 33. The people came back from spying out the promised land. And it says, there also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. We have to be very careful what we're looking at. What we're filtering, what we're seeing going on in this country right now. We have to be very mindful of what's going on. And how we see what's happening. Come on, are y'all with me? See, 1 Samuel 28, 5 and 6, it says, When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Saul was always worried about what he was seeing. 
he was always, his eyes, it was what, it was what Haley was talking about, their, the soul. Nick's been talking about that on Wednesday nights. See, we have to know that the enemy will always try to be bigger than Jesus. The devil always makes himself out to be bigger and badder. Come on, have you ever seen them commercials for them horror shows that come out with the demons and all that? I know it's unsettling, isn't it? You're like, man, I ain't. Yeah, don't watch that mess. But he's always making himself out to be more powerful and more scary than he really is. But he's not. He's trying to always intimidate us. And he's always going to try to make himself out to be bigger than he is. And he's always going to try to camp out next to you to intimidate you. But he is powerless unless you get into fear and doubt. Because when you get into fear and doubt, then faith and peace leave. Faith and peace will run together. Because you can't fear and doubt and still be walking in faith and peace. Come on. That's why it's important that we are in Christ and that we are in right alignment with the kingdom and that we are maturing and being equipped for the work of service. Come on. It's important. It's vital. See, Jesus tells us very clearly, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, uh oh, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Mm. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs of your head are are all numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Look at verse 32. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Herein lies the key to peace with all men. Is that when you have your eyes set on Jesus and you are growing and maturing... In the Lord, then you don't have to worry about what's going on in the world because you're the one who brings the peace into every situation. You're the peacemaker, you're the one that brings it right into the midst of this darkness and right into the midst of all the cute confusion. You're the very one that walks right in the midst of that because your identity is in Christ and it is him who is at working in you and you're not fearing what their opinion is or what their belief is or, come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Yes. 
See, we talk about peace and our peace in Jesus. And here we read, he didn't come to bring peace. And it's not going to be man. It's not going to be peace here on earth while man is in charge. Only when he comes and sets his reign up will we actually know peace. Come on. But right now, his reign is on the inside of us. That's why it's so vital to be in right alignment with the kingdom. If you're not in right alignment with the kingdom, then you're susceptible to fear, doubt, worry, anxieties. Come on. Because you're going to get to a point where you're just, God's trying to get you to the next level and then all of a sudden, you start feeling anxiety. And all of a sudden, worry starts kicking in. And all of a sudden, come on, you start going backwards in faith and not forwards. And it's going to be hard to be the peacemaker when you're going backwards in faith and not forward. Come on. Only when Jesus comes, there will be true peace. See, this is why we must understand that peace isn't a place. It's a calm heart in the midst of all the turmoil that's in the world that hates Jesus. Man, that's so important. So vital to understand. Because people tell you all the time, well, the Bible contradicts itself. And if you just read that right there, you think it's contradictory, but it's not. He's explaining to us that only until we're in Christ maturing and growing can we have true peace here in the midst of turmoil. Come on. In a world that hates him. See, we become a sweet aroma to those who are being saved. We read it last week in 2 Corinthians 2.14. It says, but to but thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. I don't care. You can go to the beer joint and ask them, do you love God? You know what they're going to say? Yes, we love God. But you know what the problem is? They don't know him. And we become a sweet aroma when we know God. Because if we know him, then we know what he says is good for us. We know that he's for us. When we come in right alignment, when we're maturing and we're growing, come on. When we don't fear man, when we don't fear what's going on in this world, come on. We're a sweet aroma. See, we have to know him. And that's what gives off the sweet aroma. See, he says, of the knowledge of him in every place. That's everywhere you go. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing. Look in John chapter 3. Verse 17. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the un only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Jesus didn't come to judge the world. See, the word of God that was established before he got here has judged. That's why we have 
We have to be in right alignment. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but its end is destruction. Its end is destruction. The word of God is, is a light that shines on us. That's why when we start going backwards in faith, when we're not obedient to come in right alignment, there's not going to be peace. It's not going to be peace. When we don't come in right alignment, and that's not me saying it, it's the word of God saying it, but the problem is I'm in Christ I'm a representative of Christ, so the people that aren't in right alignment will hate me because of the Christ in me. Same goes for you. Because when the light has come, oh man, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Our life living in right alignment as peacemakers exposes the, come on. What, what happens when somebody walks in a dark room and turns a light on somebody? It's offensive, isn't it? That's the same way when you walk into somebody's life that is not living in right alignment. When your, your kids are out of alignment, they don't want to come into your house because mom and daddy is going to church. Come on. And you become offensive to your own children. Your parents that aren't living in right alignment, you become offensive to your parents. And that's why it says, the enemies of your own household. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that there's no, you, you're the one bringing the peace. You're the peacemaker. Come on. And your good deeds, listen, there's things that I do serving others I really don't want to do, but because they're not in right alignment, I do them so that it's serving them, so that they'll be able to see. Come on. That's being a peacemaker. I'm not preaching to them. I'm just doing a good deed. Come on. Let your works be, your good deeds be seen among men. See, that's just shining a light. You don't have to, they may not understand it, but they don't have to understand it. Eventually, you're breaking a wall down that the devil's built up around them to keep them from receiving what the, the seed, all you're doing is cultivating the ground for them to receive the word of God to be a peacemaker in their life. Come on, man. I'm telling you right now, the church has been its own worst enemy. When we started preaching a guilt and condemnation preaching to get people to come say a prayer so we could put a number on the wall, we started pushing people away and building walls. And so now we are really offensive to people. Come on. And it's hard to be a sweet aroma. See, when we're walking in the light and the knowledge of him, people come into our lives and we'll, they'll have different reactions determined on their belief, how they were treated in church, what they see, what they hear. Come on. 
Because, see, we form our belief systems right here first on what we see and proceed, pr perceive the church to be. And we build that on how we grew up, what we see on the news, what we see. Come on. That's where our belief system, instead of getting in the word, knowing God and building our belief system on the word. Come on. We build it off of being hurt, a preacher running off with the piano player. Come on. The preacher stealing the money, getting thrown in prison. See, we're, 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 we're building our belief system off of what the enemy came in and divided and not on the word of God. Listen, it doesn't matter if I leave here and run off. That does not affect you. It should not affect you. Because you should be rooted and grounded in the word of God. And if a pastor and an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher are doing their job, it never affects you one bit. The saddest thing to me when, 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 uh, when uh, the TV evangelists all fail is how the people fell with them. And I thought, how shallow was that faith? How shallow was their faith? And then we had to all work through, well, look what happened. I, my cathedral is out here in the world, out here in the woods. I go to church on the lake. No, you don't. <laughs> oh. See, we who know and believe are exposing the evil deeds of darkness. And man, the devil don't like that. He don't like it. See, our culture has successfully erased absolute truth and a biblical worldview. Our culture has been teaching since the 80s choice, preference, tolerance. Our colleges have been infected with a Marxist uh, agenda. Come on. And they have been slowly eroding away at our moral character in this country. Now they are taking all of the history. They're trying to erase our very history. Let me tell you, that is the devil. And the devil has the loudest voice right now at the moment. And he's trying to rob our peace away from us. But you got to keep your absolute, know that the word of God is the absolute truth. It's the truth. There's no, oh, well, maybe since God's love and he loves me. Come on, I can get by with this. Yeah, he loves you, but God is also a just God. And that's what's tough when you're making disciples because the very word means to be disciplined. Come on. And that means you're gonna align yourself with the word of God to be a disciple, to be disciplined. Come on. Nobody likes discipline. And there ain't one person in here like when mama wore your butt out. But was it good for you? Yes, it was good for you. I skipped school the very first. The whole first week of school, my mama would drop me off. I'd walk in one door, walk out the next, and go climb up in the pecan tree. I'd sneak all the way home. 
I knew the secretary, the principal secretary, I knew what her car looked like because they lived down the road and I would hide in the bushes till she drove by, then I'd walk home. You don't think my mama didn't wear me out? I'm talking about it was the first time my mama ever pulled my pants down and whooped my bare butt with that old go-go belt. Remember them old go-go belts with them white knots all in it? Wow. And then I rode my bike back to school with a flat tire. No. Mama did enough. Daddy didn't have to do that. <laughs> Come on. I never skipped school again. <laughs> See, we'll be offensive to religious people holding to a form of godliness. You're going to be offensive to those people. We'll be offensive to the intolerant tolerance crowd. Come on, the people screaming tolerance are the intoler most intolerant people out there. Talk about hypocrite. And then they want to call the church people hypocrites. Oh, man. We're going to be offensive to the preference and choice crowd. But to those hurting and broken and crying out, because of all these different mindsets, we're going to be a sweet aroma, walking in peace, being a peacemaker. That's what we'll be. We're not going to be out there hollering, repent you sinner. It's the kindness of God that draws men into repentance. <clears throat> Come on. If the church would start learning to fish instead of crowd... <laughs> Man, y'all got to get that. If we'd learn to start fishing instead of crowding, pushing, shoving, if we'd learn to start cultivating and planning, come on, then we would start winning more people into the kingdom. Come on. See, if we, we can learn to walk in peace and recognize that it's not, it's not us that people are offended at, but it's the Word and the Holy Spirit that's at work in our lives. That's what people are offended at. And that's why Ephesians tells us that uh, it, we war not with flesh and blood. Our battle is with the prince and powers of the air. See, then we can hold our peace and walk in peace and be peacemakers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peak measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, there's got to be something that's going on in our life that people see and go, man, that's awesome. Look, they're, they're serving people. They're, you know, they've made a difference in my life. Them coming into my life have made a difference in my life. See, when we love and serve people that don't believe, that's being a light in a dark world. That's bringing 
the light into a dark world. When it says equipping in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. That word equipping there means complete furnishing, repair, or adjust. Prepare, restore, perfect. See, we are being restored. We are being repaired. Come on, when we come to Christ, he begins to work on our soul. Remember what uh, Nick was saying? Our spirit saved, our body will be saved when the revelation of Jesus Christ, but our soul is being saved. We are a three-part being, and it's in our soul where our mind, our will, and our emotions all function. Our feelings. Those have all got to be saved. Because it's your mind, your will, and emotions that when the enemy comes and encamps around you, you either going to fear or you're going to stand in faith knowing that he is for you. See, it takes time to work that. It's a process that we're coming in alignment with that God is for me. Who can be against me? Go on in camp around about me because there's more of me than there is of them. Come on. See, that takes time to build that and to know that. See, what is he perfecting? He's perfecting that soul, our mind, our will, and emotions, that when we come up and face trouble, that when we're standing in the midst of darkness, we can still be the peacemaker. We can still be that sweet aroma. Come on, we were... We were in uh, Corsicana uh, Friday and Saturday preaching at a marriage conference. And uh, Friday night after the conference, I w we were going to the motel room. And to be honest, I was tired. I was just wore out. We, I moved 194 rolls of hay out of the hay field. I was wore out and tired, just got through preaching, and I was, I was ready to get in the motel room and do nothing. And so when we pull up, I've got all the bags, and Wendy, and Keisha, and, and Barbara, and I don't even know, I can't remember who all was there, but we were, we were going to the motel room, and we pull up, and we see this lady standing there, and I don't, I don't know what's going on, but she is not, it's not good. And her husband, I hear her go, I don't get a F what you say. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, this is fixing to go down bad. I don't want no part of this. I'm going into my room. Because one thing I learned when I was a heathen in beer joints is when you go peel that husband off of that wife, She's fixing to take her high heel off and you're going to have chicken marks all over you. Happens every time. I'm minding my own business. Got my luggage. I'm going to my room. And I go through the door and I turn around. There's no girls behind me. And I'm thinking, oh, I've got to go back out of here and I'm fixing to have to fight a guy that I can't whip because his shirt says, I don't give a F about your sensitivity. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't either. <laughs> and I am like, what is my wife doing? And I go back through the, I, the doors open and I hear her, can we pray for you? And I'm like, oh. And so I walk around the corner. And the peacemaker stepped in into a horrible situation. 
she had she had ate onions she was allergic to onions and her she started closing up and course panic and fear and her husband's got the EpiPen and he's fixing to poke her and she's going no no because when you hit them with the EpiPen apparently they have to go to the hospital and she doesn't want to go to the hospital and he's going I don't give up so I done read that situation all wrong <laughs> you know but thank God them girls started praying and I'm talking about you could just slowly start seeing the peacemaker and he starts apologizing and it just changed the whole atmosphere because somebody was a light in the midst of of the darkness and a sweet aroma of the knowledge of him changed the whole atmosphere that's who we are that's why we're disciples that's why we get in right alignment because God has called us to step right in the midst of the worst situation and bring thy kingdom come. Come on. It doesn't matter where you're at. What's going on? You're the peacemaker. If y'all would stand. why this conference is so vital because what we seen that was the world crying out see we live in this society that doesn't know how to handle situations like that listen it's not their fault that they have no other vocabulary than I don't give up come on and yet God still stepped into that situation. Jesus was never scared of sinners. He was the solution for sin. And we have to realize that the world is not in the church house crying out. The world is out there crying out. It's out there where we are. That's why it's so important that we understand making disciples and equipping. Our introduction to the ministry was just like that clip of John Wayne in the movie where he picks the little boy up that says, I don't know how to swim. And he just picks him up and throws him in the water and says, now keep reaching. Grab a handful of water. Keep swimming. There you go. Listen. That is the best way to get in the ministry. <laughs> Just do it. You don't have to be perfect because you'll never be perfect. There was only one perfect. You're listen, you're gonna, it's on the job training. You're going to make mistakes. But that's what grace is for. But you got to experience what's going on. And once you start learning that, man, God, you, you're going to start feeling the very heart of God. You're going to start seeing through the eyes of God. Come on.
And let me tell you, that's when you start experiencing the kingdom. And that's when your life changes. Yes, sir. That's when your life changes. When you experience. Come on, Jim. I don't know where the mic is, but we'll share. All right. <laughs> you know, um, I didn't really experience God until I really met David. And, and we talk about rodeo in here a lot. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a cowboy. And, you know, I just came along for the ride. But, you know, it, it really is. What changed my life was in Burnett, Texas. And I've told this before. When a young man was on a bull and he got thrown off and the bull stepped on him right in his stomach guy didn't get up and I was opening the gates and David said go to him Jim and I went and laid hands on that guy right in the middle of the arena and he ended up getting up and he came back the next night and I experienced the kingdom of God and that changed my <laughs> life forever I never experienced God in that way and it and quite frankly, when David just told that story, I'm surprised he didn't go to that woman. <laughs> and, I, and I know why, because he, he didn't want to get chicken pecked. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it changed my life in the point of, if I see something like that, I go to them. I'm drawn to that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of funny. Um, and, and I'm just going to say it, you know, that's, that's part of touching the monkey. <laughs> you know, we don't want to go there. It's like, that's none of my business. <laughs> yeah. I'm not getting in the middle of that. <laughs> but that's when people really need to see the kingdom of God manifested in their lives. That's when it really makes a difference. And that's it right. made a difference in my life. And, and when we break down those walls and they start seeing that goodness of God they're not praising us man they're praising God and they didn't even realize it that's right you know they're just like what just happened yeah you know that's right you got to touch ministry yeah come on I want to share like David said there's times we're tired and we're yeah. busy I had an incident this Friday I'm working in Corpus I'm fixing to leave well the I go put on my suitcase, everything in the, in the car while I go fix and eat a hot breakfast. So I'm sitting there reading my devotional, you know, and they have a woman that I've seen since I've checked into this hotel. Her left arm is just, it's paralyzed, it's dead. <laughs> so yours have been there. Yeah. So I've, <laughs> the two weeks that I've been in this new hotel, my heart, I'm like, the Lord's kind of prompting me to go pray for it. I'm like, oh, the Lord. You let me know. Well, there's been a couple times I've passed it up because there's guys in there. They come in there to eat a hot breakfast and stuff. So anyway, this Friday, I'm sitting there. I got there a little early. I put my devotion. I'm reading, and the Lord puts it on my heart. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. <laughs> so I go over there, and I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, do you mind me asking them your situation about your arm? She had gotten hit by a drunk driver about 10, 15 years ago, Ugh. and her whole left arm is paralyzed, the nerve damage and everything. She broke her ankle. Well, they fixed that, and they said they didn't, they weren't able to get to her in enough time to save that arm or to do, you know, surgery or whatever. So I said, well, look, I, I just want to let you know I had a situation, rodeo. My whole left arm was paralyzed for a year and a half. I said, look, God's healed me. <laughs> and I said, I don't believe God can heal you. I said, would you mind me pray, praying for you? She said, yeah, I'd love, I'd love that. So I took my cap off and I laid hands on her. And it didn't happen that moment. But I'm believing, I just, That's right. I want to be obedient to yeah. what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. And see, at first I'm thinking, man, I'm fixing to eat my hot breakfast and I'm reading my devotional. <laughs> and like David said, we can get sidetracked but and not being sensitive to what God wants us to do yeah. or right. have us do. And we can miss God's plan. Yeah. So That's right. when I got through, I put my cap on and I seen the other lady that serves the hot breakfast. When I went in there and got my breakfast, she goes, 
I seen you praying for that woman. He said, you're one of us, huh? You're one of those crazy. Uh, and she said, I'm a Christ follower also. So she begins to tell me her testimony, how she was an alcoholic and what have you. She had cirrhosis of the liver and all. God had moved in her life. And she said, I was praying while you were praying for that woman. And we're believing God that she's going to be healed. You know, That's so right. don't miss we can you feel like the hamster on the wheel <laughs> yes take time to get off that wheel yeah and come on be led by the holy spirit that's good. and be obedient that's good and that's good y'all got a mic i ain't hugging my sister <laughs> <laughs> because she rejected me as a kid. <laughs> anyway, he told that story about John Wayne throwing the kid in the John Wayne <laughs> throwing the kid into the, the river to swim, to learn how to swim and it re just reminds me of um, Marty's mom always tells the story that that's how her dad taught her and her brother how to swim. <laughs> and he also did that to their cousin Billy. And the only thing was when he threw Billy in, Billy just held his nose, sank to the bottom, and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that I'm saying that is so if you step out and you get up your courage and you go and you end up sinking to the bottom, <laughs> you just walk out. Just, you know? walk out. <laughs> just just be be encouraged you did the right thing even if it didn't look like it you know look like you missed it on the top That's he right. learned how to hold his breath in the water <laughs> you know so it's the same with you you know because you all hear all good stories and you think well that didn't work for me it did yeah yeah exactly yeah you just gotta try i'm telling you there's nothing absolutely nothing that's going to change your life like when you touch ministry. When you finally touch ministry, it'll change your life. And I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over. So I want to encourage you. Look for your assignment. Look for your assignment. And it may not be your assignment. It may be somebody else's that you're encouraging, just like with Kent, you know, encouraged to put it, and then somebody else, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Is that sign like Tarkington sign language that... <laughs> I'm sitting here all morning listening to you and I'm staring at this. God showed me something. When you get in your car to travel somewhere or wherever, rodeo, fishing spot, somewhere you don't know, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> huh? You get the address, where am I going? You get in that magic little box and you tap in your address where I'm going, right? <laughs> GPS. God showed me something. The cross is our GPS. Look at it. You got east, west, north, south, heaven, <laughs> hell. God loves us from the east to the west. We can go up or we can go down. <laughs> we can go out all over the world. We're right here in the middle. And all we got to do is look at the Bible as our GPS and the little voice that talks to you, whether he's an Australian guy or a... <laughs> Vietnamese or a woman or whatever, that voice that talks to you on your GPS, the Holy Spirit is our voice that guides us. That's good. So just listen to that voice that guides us. Let this be your GPS. Can't fail. Thank you. Recalculating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He'll even recalculate us to re realign us. Come on, JJ. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Man, about 10 minutes in to David talking, I started thinking about something I heard this week, and it was on, on me all this morning, and the music started playing. I was like, oh, it's the end of service. And I was like, God, you, you got me thinking about this for a solid 45 minutes. You want me to say something? <laughs> and he was like, I just kept thinking. He was like, all right, I'm going to give four people to let you build that courage up again. <laughs> But um, I, I saw a clip of a pastor this week, and he said, heaven is not our goal. Heaven was not the goal for us. Like, if, if God wanted us in heaven, he would have just put us there. Like, we were made to be on this earth. We were made to bring the kingdom down on earth as it is in heaven. And I was just thinking, like, we bring that, we become the peacemakers when we love him first. <laughs> and we can't do that unless we love him first. And man, it's like, it's like, that's what it enables us. Like I can't, I cannot do anything effectively unless I love him first. Not just going through the motions, but I'm like, I love him, not just, I love him and I know him. <laughs> I can't, I can't be fearless in being that light. And if I love him, I'm not, I don't care if I get offended. I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna trust that seed's been planted. I can't, I can't have the courage to be a light even as a child to my I can't, I can't love the way I'm supposed to love if I don't love him first. So That's good. that was, um, it's just a whole, another thing that's just been on me on this week that it's not my strength, it's his. Everything is his strength. It's good. Because if it was mine, we're in trouble. Yep. It's <laughs> good. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you. We love you because you first loved us. And Lord, I thank you that we leave here as peacemakers in the midst of dark places, in the midst everywhere we pray that you manifest yourself, that we get to walk in the triumph of God in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for that, Father. And we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love y'all. See you Wednesday. That's it for today. Be sure to like and subscribe below. And for more information on Dayton Christian Center, visit dcctx.church. We'll see you next week.